guys, it's black. Me and Bear were sitting down and having a discussion. Thought y'all might want to listen in a little bit. What we were talking about is the way things are today, about how many of the old skills are actually pretty viable today. And we was talking about canning and putting up meat and etc. Being able to process your own food and bucket gardening and stuff like that. Now, what I do for me, um, hunting, fishing, that's a no-brainer. That's something that I have a background for and Bear has the same thing. I run a small bucket garden where I've got tomatoes, lettuce, things like that. Mostly to make salad stuff for me and the wife. And it's just to keep up the skill of how to grow stuff and I save my buckets every year and replant for the next year. And something that I've been following is this uh, trash gardens, where you get an onion, you're gonna cut up anyway. And you take that nub, you put your three, four toothpicks in it and put it in a cup of water and let it re-sprout and put it in the garden and remake you another onion and carrots, you can do the same thing, celery, lettuce, all of it, you're gonna cook it in. Pineapple. It just seems odd to think, you know, when you think about how hot it is in Hawaii, and Alabama being the same kind of hot and humid, why don't we grow pineapples? We don't, it does. I mean, well, I mean, is the climate warm and moist? Yeah. Do we got good soil? Yeah. I've never heard anybody down here growing pineapple. I don't know that anybody's ever tried. That might be an idea. Can you grow pineapple in Alabama? Food for thought. Food for thought. That's a pretty good one. Now, you do a lot of canning. I do. I have. <clears throat> now, the rotation that I remember with my grandmother is, let's say, that squash came in season. You would get a mess of squash. You'd cook enough for this meal. You'd freeze enough Probably you actually cook enough for two meals, and then you'd freeze half of that and put that up. And then the other part's what you can. And so you were always supplying, you had your fresh, you had your frozen, you had your can. And then whenever it went out of season, that's when you went to your frozen. And then whenever the frozen started running down, you're about three quarters of the way around the year, then you go to your can. And then it came back in season. So you could have it around the clock, so to speak. Yeah, another good way to do it is pickling. Mm -hmm. You can take the squash and you can pickle it and make squash pickles. They're delicious. My mother has done it for years. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that will extend shelf life beyond mm -hmm. what now, you know, you, you cook a uh, cook. When you can, you're actually cooking. Yeah. And take that and it'll have a shelf life for two, three, four years. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I do particularly with meats. Mm -hmm. I will buy the meat and I will put it in the freezer and then when it's been in there for you know a while mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's getting toward that time where you need to do something with it, mm -hmm. just put it into a uh, you know, cook, go ahead and thaw mm -hmm. it out and cook it mm -hmm. and then pressure can it. Mm -hmm. And then you've extended that the life of that for another at least five years. So yeah, that, that'd be a good rotation for that. <clears throat> the rotation that I saw was the fresh. You only got a couple of days or so before it's gonna go bad anyway. A week or two, depending on what it is. A, a week. Depending. Ish. <laughs> and Granny would just cook like a, a big enough pot so that what what eat the leftovers would then be transferred and frozen. Well, that was good up to a year, okay. And then she would can X amount. Well, that's good for three to five years. She would then label it, and it normally took about, I remember when she was setting my sister up to do this, it took her two years to get the rotation all the way through. Okay, okay had to change location. So back to you. We were talking about canning and putting foods up and things like that. Now, what all kind of meat can you can or put up? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How about fish? <clears throat> you can. Mm -hmm. um, I have never done it. Mm -hmm. But it has to be a fatty fish. Mm -hmm. 
something like you would smoke. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your smoked salmons, your trout, mm -hmm. something of that nature. Well, that was the thing with me. I remember growing up, we always froze fish, mm -hmm. and I'd always heard you could can fish, but I never knew anybody that canned fish. Me either. I've heard of people canning mullet. I hadn't even thought about that. I know mullet's kind of fatty, especially to get it close to breeding cycle. Yeah, and you know, down here the water is so warm, we really don't have a lot of fatty fish. Now mm -hmm. there's there's a few little you know breeds here and there, right? Species, but overall, I mean, it's in cold water climates. Yeah. That you find most of your fatty fish. But yeah, I mean, you can you can can fish, chicken. You can can uh, pig, yeah, pork, beef, just whatever. Well, now, whenever we did a lot of canning of the deer and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, because mostly because we had family members that enjoyed the taste of, of deer, right? And in the middle of summer, when it was out of season and you couldn't legally get it, they'd get a taste for deer. Because you said you couldn't have it. If you tell somebody it's out of season, suddenly they're craving it. And uh, that's whenever the canned deer would come out and get utilized or frozen. A lot of times it's frozen. But uh, I've often wondered about what, with all the stuff we got available um, down here year round now, it's just an advantage to have some sort of idea on how to do a lot of this stuff just for food getting so dang expensive. Um, <clears throat> when was the last time you walked to the grocery store? The other day. It's getting scarce. It it was shocking how many empty shelves there are. Yeah. And uh, this that should not happen. Uh. -uh. Here. No. And looking at um, the canned cat food, give you an idea. We were picking up a forty can of forty cans of cat food was fourteen dollars. It's twenty five dollars now. Mm -hmm. So that put a hurt on getting cat food. Mm -hmm. um, canned foods and stuff like that are getting scarcer, and steak and stuff like that's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. um, we were looking at a, a <clears throat> cut the other day, and I picked up, and it was $52 for that hunk of meat. I mean, wow. it was a big, nice hunk of steak, and it was nicely marbled. I mean, it was big boy. Yeah. Like 20 something ounce steak, yeah, but not $50 of, no, uh uh. Mm -hmm. No. If I'm gonna pay fifty dollars, they need to put. They need somebody else needs to cook it for me. <laughs> well, you and I both know. Back in them days, you know, I could buy a cow in the uh, right place. It's it's probably cheaper to you know get two or three friends and go in on halves or quarters. Yeah. And buy a cow because there's a lot of folks out there that are selling cattle yeah. on the hoof. Yeah. It's probably cheaper. I know it's cheaper for a hog right now because I had somebody the other day who was offering me half a hog for $200. And that's like a 400 pound hog. That'd be about 150 pounds of meat. Sure. And so that'd be processed and everything they got done. Now would you process it? They are processing. Process it? Yeah. Okay. And so it was $200 for the half of a hog. Because what it was is the, the processor owes them. They got them some deer last season so they owe them. So he's going to take them a hog, he's going to take four hogs up there and process them. And they wanted uh, two hogs for them, and they were selling two hogs at 200, 200, so they'd get 800 bucks out of it. And they'd get the things butchered, so that was the deal. He wanted to know if I wanted in on it, and I said, nah, I'm okay. But I don't have that big a freezer, and I need to invest in a freezer or get into canning. I would get into canning for it, man. Um, you can take the pork meat and you can can it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, dice it up, mm -hmm. and just raw pack it. Mm -hmm. Put you uh, about a tablespoon full of sugar. Well, depends on how much, how big your jar is. Mm -hmm. If I remember, I'd have to check my, my books at the house. But for like, for, if you're doing a quart mm -hmm. jar of meat, it's like a tablespoon of salt. Mm -hmm. And if you got a pint jar, it's like a teaspoon of salt. Don't quote me on my numbers. Okay. It's been a while. Now, when you put it in there, you sprinkle it over the whole thing, and it, is the meat dry in there, or is it a brine? Put the salt in first, uh -huh. and then 
you, when you raw pack it, uh -huh. you just put your meat in on top of it, seal it up, finger tight, and then put it in your canner. Uh -huh. And when it cooks, it creates its own juice. Ah, I got it. That's, that's what I have found. Mm -hmm. um, if you're doing ground beef, <clears throat> from personal experience, mm -hmm. cook your ground beef before you put it in the jar because what you wind up with is a solid clump of meat. And you, it's delicious. You can eat it, but you got to dig it out with a spoon. I got you. And I learned that one the hard way. Okay. If you go ahead and cook it before you can it, then you don't run into that. I was around it, and like you and I both grew up, during the, the canning season, every dang little house around there, you heard a rattler going on it. That pressure cooker rattler going at the... Uh, Peas, butter beans, fruit, whatever being put up. Yeah, my mom did a lot, and she doesn't do much anymore, but she did a lot of blanching, mm -hmm. which is bring it up to a slow boil for just a couple of minutes, kill the heat, and then when it cools down, put it into bags and put it in the freezer. Yeah. Canning is different. Yeah. You know, blanching it and freezing it is much, much different from canning. Mm -hmm. And see, I was in a lot on the the blanching and freezing because yeah. we would take the square milk containers mm -hmm. and recycle them. For those that don't know, back in the day, milk came in a half gallon square cardboard thing, like a little about juice bottle, tall. about that tall, and you would split them open, clean them out real good, and you'd put your meat, your fruit, your whatever, and fill it solid full of water, like fish, you'd fill it full of water, and freeze it solid and it'd be a brick. And you take it out and just sit it in the pot, let it thaw out, and then you pull your fish out and you can fry them or whatever. Yeah, we did fish that way. A lot of go, fish. Go catch a mess of brim or bass. Cats. Cats. Fillet them out. Mm -hmm. Put them in there, fill them up with water, drop them in the freezer. When you're ready, set them in the sink, let them thaw, do what you want to. Yeah, it's just like it's fresh meat again. And we did that. We, uh, some deer meat. I know we did it with uh, coon meat. Because coon is so fatty, that's what would be ground up with deer meat, which was so lean to make hamburger like. Yeah, we didn't do coon. Daddy, uh, Daddy grew up eating a lot of coon. Eating a lot of coon. Yeah. He, he, when he when he got up, when he set up his house, he said, uh -uh. "Yeah." Well, <laughs> that that's the way my grandmother was a possum. Yeah. Um, I remember the pride I had when I got a possum. I bet I was maybe eight or nine years old. And we were down on the creek, me and a couple boys looking, and so I saw this big fat possum, and I got a club, and I got me a possum. And I came up there, and I was so tickled. You know, I was a great hunter of the north type deal. My grandmother was just, she didn't want to eat that thing. She hated that thing. She'd ate too much of that thing. The lady that lived next door, Miss uh, Old Nooner, she was the one that me and her cleaned that, and she cooked possum for me. Possum and sweet potatoes is good. Oh, yeah. And uh, but I couldn't eat possum at home. Granny wouldn't eat it. I could eat squirrel. I could eat rabbit. I had a lot of rabbit. Mm -hmm. And uh, rabbit is too lean, and you actually can't. You're not supposed to eat nothing but rabbit. It's a it's a lean. You can starve to death eating rabbit. And so Granny would make rabbit and uh, eggplant. She'd cook eggplant with it, fried eggplant yeah. and rabbit. I know a lot of people look at that like, ew, but... Well, no, I've had both, and they're delicious, but I never thought about putting them together. Yeah, that was always the vegetable that she wanted to do it. If she was going to cook rabbit, it was going to be eggplant with it. Don't knock fried eggplant, folks. It's good. It's good stuff, guys. It really it's is. Good. Fried squash is good. Bull squash, fried squash, baked squash. Okra. Okra. Okra's a great thickener. I had a lot of stews with it, and everybody don't like it plain boiled, but... There were times we were poor, you had plain boiled. I'll, I'll eat it plain boiled all day. Yeah. My granddaddy called it boogers in a bowl, too, but yeah, we absolutely. ate it. You know, It'll it, fill a hollow spot. It will fill you up. That's just about it. But today, I've heard um, if somebody wanted to learn canning, mm -hmm. let's say canning fruit mm -hmm. or vegetables, I've heard about a good way to do it is you go get the big frozen bag of mixed vegetables for cheap at the grocery store and practice canning on them. Um, because A, it's like you said, all it is is blanched and frozen. Mm -hmm. And it's something that you're gonna have just a couple bucks in the bag, so if you screw this up, you're not out a lot of money. 
if I were to make a suggestion, yeah. the very first thing that I would do is contact your county agent. And this is true anywhere in the country? Anywhere in the country. Con every county in the United States has a federal agent an ag for agriculture. Okay. They teach you how to can. Really? They will teach you how to can. They will teach you how to raise bees. They will teach you how to grow fruit. You can go in there. They have pamphlets lining the walls. Hmm. Six, eight, ten, twelve deep. Just go in there and just pick what you want to read. And just go, go to your county ag agent's office mm -hmm. and just raid the shelf. It's all free. I never knew that. I need to do that. Yes, they will They will have regularly, well, I say regularly scheduled classes. They will have classes mm -hmm. put on by specialists mm -hmm. that will teach you how to can. Hmm. They will teach you how to raise bees. They will teach you how to raise fruit trees. Anything agricultural. Mm -hmm. They'll, they'll teach you how to do it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so many of our viewers are urban. Yeah. So you're, they're going to have a county agent too. Mm -hmm. But their possibilities are going to be possibly more limited than ours are. Yeah. Because but they would have access they would to what have, we they, got. They've got all the access to the information because it's put out by the USDA. Mm hmm Okay. okay. <clears throat> Contact your agent. Mm -hmm. See what they've got. Go in and talk to them. Walk in the door. Say hello. Pick up a pamphlet. Mm -hmm. Because you can learn a whole lot from just reading the pamphlet. Mm -hmm. And you find something that you really like, there's probably a class going to be taught on it. Mm -hmm. my, my coming up was I was a hunter and a fisherman. That was my contribution to the family was to hunt and fish. Mm -hmm. Um, I could run a little garden. My thing was growing watermelons, cantaloupes, those type things, peppers. Those are good cash crops. And it's something you can exchange easy and put up. Yeah, if you're a kid mm -hmm. who has a couple of acres not doing anything, yeah, put you in a, a watermelon patch. Mm -hmm. Get you, you know, get your dad's truck mm -hmm. and put it on the side of the road full of watermelons. You'll make a killing. Yeah, you could, you could find yourself through college. <laughs> People will stop just to buy watermelons. I remember that. But I mean, when I was growing up, my thing was I, my contribution was hunting and fishing, and that was putting stuff in the freezer. Um, the little garden that I ran was watermelons, cantaloupes, that type of stuff. Other family members did more elaborate gardens. Now here recently, I've got, like I said, I do um, two or three kinds of lettuce. Uh, I've got the small cherry tomatoes in buckets because they make good tomato sandwiches. And for my northern friends, if you've never had a tomato sandwich, plain old light bread, mayonnaise, it's a BLT without the bacon. That's it. It's a good sandwich. But my wife and I love to eat them during the summer when they're in season. But growing the big tomatoes takes so long. And I like these small, they're about when they're full of the grown cherry tomatoes. They're a cherry tomato and they're almost the size of a golf ball. Yeah. Well, you take two of them and slice it and you got a tomato sandwich. Right. And at the same time, you can put them in salads easy. They cook up easy, put them in the thing. A lot of times, dice them up and cook them with eggs in the morning. Spanish omelets. Spanish omelets, uh, quick and easy. And it's just something that I augment. And like I was talking about, uh, trash gardening. Uh, you take, you cut up an onion, and you're going to eat the onion, but it's that end piece you're going to throw away. That, if you will just look online, they'll tell you how to do this. You can regrow that into another onion. And since you're going to be buying the onion anyway to make spaghetti tonight, why not go ahead and start these little bitty gardens just to practice this skill? Because times could get a lot harder than they are now. You know, everybody thinks it never could happen. That's what they said when the Great Depression happened. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah and, you know... Our parents were children of the Depression. Yeah. And our grandparents were, were grown and raised in families during the Depression. Yeah. Um, my granddaddy always used to talk about how <clears throat> around here you you felt it. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was no denying it. Mm -hmm. But because we were so agrarian, mm -hmm. it was such a large agricultural community. 
it didn't affect us as much as it did, say, somebody in Montgomery or Birmingham mm -hmm. or Atlanta or Chicago or mm -hmm. Cincinnati or pick your city. Well, they did like my family did where, let's say, your aunt has a big butter bean patch. Mm -hmm. She would grow and pick butter beans because she was good at it. Mm -hmm. And then her surplus, she would horse trade yes. to somebody else for squash or mm -hmm. for whatever. Eggs. Eggs. Chicken. Etc. Yeah. Um, you were talking about crops, uh, about hunting. Right. Oh. I, uh, Not important. I don't need my car insurance. Go ahead. <laughs> your, your warranty's about My warranty's about to expire, yeah. yeah. Anyway, we we did, uh, my brother and I did a lot of hunting mm -hmm. and fishing, mm -hmm. uh, but we raised cattle. Mm -hmm. Where we're sitting at now used to be a cow pasture, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not anymore, it's planted pines. But that having been said, we had hogs, mm -hmm. and we had cows, and we had meat in the freezer. Mm -hmm. Because we would take one to, the, there used to be a packing house across town, a custom meats place. I remember that place. And they would, uh, they would go in there, you'd take your hog in your trailer, mm -hmm. offload them, and then they would take it from there. You know, the hog would walk in this end and sausage and bacon and come whatever out else end. would come out the other end. Yep. Pork chops. <clears throat> and same thing with the cow. Mm -hmm. You know, you would have... You know, the cow would walk in this end, and outside the other end would come hamburger and steak and roasts and mm -hmm. whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, now, a lot of people don't have the space or the time to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. But I will bet you know somebody, I will bet you know somebody who does. Yeah. This would be an, a great opportunity mm -hmm. to talk to them. Mm -hmm. and say, hey, can we go in on hams? Mm -hmm. Or talk to three or four people. Mm -hmm. Can we go in on, on shares? Mm -hmm. And get you a calf mm -hmm. that's been weaned mm -hmm. and raise it off mm -hmm. over the summer. Let it just, you know, grass is free. Yeah, let it graze until let it, it got graze. fat. Supplement it with a little bit of corn. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, whatever. It's just some grain to, mm -hmm. to help fatten it up and then in the fall or in the winter take it to a processing plant and process have it mm -hmm. processed and then y'all take your shares. I've seen that done with cows, I've seen it done with pigs, I've seen oh, yeah. it done with sheep, goats. Yes. yes. Goat makes fan for those that don't know, goat makes fantastic barbecue. It's one of the best barbecue it, meats there is to me. It to really, really does. And it's also good for keeping your woodline trimmed. Yeah, they're great for that. Um, we had the property that we owned years ago, there was this ditch that was along the road and it was just simply too steep to run a lawnmower. I mean, it was just too difficult. So I went to a, a uh, junkyard and I got a big truck tire with a rim still in it. I put an eye bolt through one of the, the lug nut holes and had a welder tack weld it. And then I put a big swivel on it and about a 15 feet of chain. And I, we took a, one of the smaller goats, Susie was about that tall and about that long, we put a big dog harness on it, and I hooked her to it. And we'd stand the tire up and roll it to where we needed to go and flop it flat and hook Susie to it and give her plenty of water, and she would manicure mm -hmm. that ditch. Yeah, there are people, uh, particularly out west, mm -hmm. uh, that hire out downs. I think it's in the state of California. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But I think they will actually rent out goats to clear off hard to clear land. Yeah. They'll bring out a herd of goats and just let them yeah. eat everything in sight. <clears throat> but we, you know, coming back around to the start of the conversation, mm -hmm. um, yes, there are, you hear threats every day of food shortages. Mm -hmm. There are, um, you know, we're seeing it. Mm -hmm. And there are ways to supplement mm -hmm. gardening. Mm -hmm. For example, if you know somebody who lives on the edge of town and has a couple of acres, yeah, there's an opportunity. Well, even not even that, bucket gardening. Bucket gardening, yes. Bucket gardening is what can, I do. It's, you it's can quick raise, and easy. Yeah, you can raise all the food your family will need in five-gallon buckets on your back porch of your apartment. Yep. I have found that two buckets with those tomato plants 
will provide all the tomatoes we need for mm -hmm. a seed. Four lettuce plants that you cut off, just cut it down to enough, mm -hmm. and in two weeks it's grown back that much. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a constant weekly rotation now with just four plants, right. producing all the salads and stuff like that we need for a garnish or whatever on the side. Next year I'm going to add a few bell peppers and a few onions. Right. The advantage to a bucket is I can pick it up and move it. Mm -hmm. So if we've got a severe storm coming in, I can move my buckets underneath the shelter. Mm -hmm. I don't have something planted I can't dig up. I can move it. Well, you know, think about this. People in apartments, mm -hmm. everybody, well, I say everybody, guardedly, yeah. has got a balcony. Mm -hmm. Or some lighted or they've area. Got, they've got some balcony. They've got some sort of a back porch. Mm -hmm. Put two, go two five-gallon buckets on either side, and you won't go hungry. Yeah, there'll be something to eat. There'll be something to eat. Um, you know, learn how to go when you go into the agent. Talk to them about baking. Mm -hmm. You know, you go in and you buy a loaf of bread. I've seen bread recently as as, as much as almost like four bucks a loaf. When was the last time you ever saw four buck bread? No. When all it is, you know, we both make beer bread. Yeah. It's so super simple and cheap to make once there, you figure out how to do it. There's three three elements. There's your flour, mm -hmm. there's a pinch of salt, and there's a can of beer. That's it, stir it I up. Don't, I don't drink, okay? Mm -hmm. I, that's just a taste I've never had. Mm -hmm. But I keep a six-pack in my, in my pantry to make beer bread. Beer bread, yep. And the cheaper the beer, the better, actually. Absolutely. You ain't got to look for taste. What's on sale? That sounds like a lo that's six loaves of bread, yeah. you know. You know, that's 24 cans for a buck. <laughs> 20, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that kind of cheap special. Yeah. And uh, it does a good job at making uh, making bread. Well, all you're looking for, it's it's got sugar in it, mm -hmm. okay? It's also got yeast in it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's your trigger, mm -hmm. is the yeast. Um, but talk to your county agent. They will teach you how to cook, how to bake if you don't already know how to bake. And, and uh, I have priced it that a big sack of flour, mm -hmm. and I'm, when I say big, I'm talking about a 20-pound sack of flour, is in the long run cheaper than buying the bread. Mm -hmm. It really is, and that's, that's something that we figured out, where if you go and look in the grocery stores, have the big tubs of ketchup. Mm -hmm. The big thing of mayonnaise, mm -hmm. the big thing of mustard. Yeah, those number ten jars. Number ten, them, and I, we have bought one of them, mm -hmm. and that was five months worth of ketchup. Mm -hmm. Where sure. we put in the back bottom of the refrigerator went the unused part, and we just kept refilling yes. the one we were using every night at the table. Well, that was that one four dollars and fifty cent thing of ketchup, which was this big. That was six months worth of ketchup mm -hmm. instead of three dollars a bottle. For the little bitty one. Yeah. And if you'll look at the shelf life on it, if you'll when you're standing in the store, if you'll read the mm -hmm. shelf, the expiration date on it, it's usually a year and a half out. Yeah. And that'll sit on your shelf. Yeah. For a year and a half. I do coffee that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I drink coffee by the gallon. Mm -hmm. And I've got cans of coffee dated, you know, the date that mm -hmm. I bought them in my cabinet. Mm -hmm. And I just work through them chronologically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, buy one, replace one. Mm -hmm. or, I mean, use one, open one, replace one. There's, there's a saying. Mm -hmm. Three is two. Mm -hmm. Two is one. One is none. Yep. And we're, we're getting sort of off into a, yeah. you know, a, a another video. Right. <laughs> but I agree but, with you. You know, I was, I, there's, can I plug another channel? Sure, do. Prep Stetters. Okay, I haven't heard of it. Go ahead. Okay. Prep Stetters is done by a lady out of Nashville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to, Krista, Krista Sykes mm -hmm. is her name. And she was talking about, she brought out all these batteries and mm -hmm. how they were great and with this, that, and the other. And down in the comments, I made that condition. Two videos later, mm -hmm. she said, three is two. Two is one and one is none. Mm -hmm. Because if you think about it in a situation, mm -hmm. if you've got one can of soup mm -hmm. and six people to feed, it ain't gonna be much. It's gonna be real thin. 
It's going to be a, a drink of water, and that's about yeah. it. Yeah. And then, you know, but if you buy six cans on sale and use one, buy you two more. Mm hmm. Or, keep or your, whatever. Keep your larder. We used to call it a larder. A larder, yes. Lots of people still do. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go and you buy a can of canned meat, mm -hmm. if you buy one, buy a second. Mm -hmm. And then when you open the first one, go buy another one. And just keep building up your supply. Mm -hmm. That's the way to stay ahead of, the, of this can, this food shortage mm -hmm. that we're seeing materialize. Well, we saw when we were growing up, because we were both, well, you were better off, your family was better off than mine, but we would buy the big, you know, 25, 35 pound bags of rice. Mm -hmm. Well, we would take glass jars, and uh, I mean, the big glass jars. Yep. And we would fill up them big glass jars because the bag was too easy to get weevils and other stuff in it once yeah. you'd opened it. Yes. And so we'd, I put, do that. we'd put them in the glass jars and then we'd date it, put a piece of masking tape over the top and we'd yeah. write a date. And they would rotate through and so that took care of all of our rice needs for the next two and a half months. Yeah, easy. When you got to halfway, you went and bought another bag. That's the theory that I'm working on. And you were you were always had a minimum of three months worth of food sitting at the house any day of the week. Mm -hmm. So you had, like I said before, you ate fresh, but you would get a good deal or whatever on, let's say, squash. You'd cook a big mess of squash. What wasn't eat, the leftover, which was a big pile, was frozen, probably divided into three For pieces. Rice. No, I'm talking about like squash. Oh, okay, squash, I'm sorry. Would be frozen. So that's your frozen. So right. you've got a constant rotation of that. So not only have I got a meal here, I've got a couple more meals coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Rice, you would keep that going. Potatoes, we'd get the big 50-pound bag. Mm -hmm. How many damn days have you sat in the damn kitchen peeling? I know I don't want to count them. But we then we would put up. Potatoes would be sliced to be put up. They'd be put in liquid as, as whole potatoes that would just peel. Um, blanched and canned. That was super simple to put up. Um, the big jars. Then there were frozen potatoes and stuff like that. And we had all kinds of things so that at any given moment you had fresh, you had frozen, and then you had a hard can deep. So that if I, if they turn the power off tomorrow, I'm going to start eating the fresh and start eating the frozen until it's gone before I ever go to my can. Us down here, us having hurricanes, you could have power out for a week. Oh, yeah. Do you remember Eloise? Yeah. When we were kids, mm -hmm. we had a hurricane come through named Eloise. It was about 1972-ish. 72, 73, somewhere yeah. in there. We were without electricity at our house for 14 days. Mm-hmm. My daddy, folk, mama called him a junk collector. Mm -hmm. He loved his antiques. Mm-hmm. And he had a lot of cast ironware. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? We had the only fireplace in the neighborhood. That still worked. Period. Yeah. We had the only fireplace in the neighborhood. And I watched my mama for two weeks mm -hmm. take daddy's cast iron and clean it up and get it ready. And people would bring her their food. Yep. And she would cook it during that time. Mm -hmm. And send, they would bring her a dish to put it in. Mm -hmm. She when it was cooked, she put it back in yep. their dish, and they would take it home. Yeah. And that way, everybody was eating their food, and none of it went to spoil because it was all being consumed. Yep. I've we, still got that cast iron. Bar. We uh, <laughs> when we had one of the hurricanes come through here, um, a friend of mine's <coughs> house and them got kind of damaged, and I went over and spent five days playing cook in his front yard where mm -hmm. I took all my rendezvous. Cook yeah. set, my Dutch ovens, etc. And there's tons of firewood laying around. A lot I'm of glad you said, I'm glad you said that yeah. about being about rendezvousing. Yeah. About um, living history. The, there's the huge joke mm -hmm. about living history people being eccentric and crazy until the lights go out. And then suddenly everybody wants them. And then suddenly, hey, <laughs> you've got that on you. When they <laughs> you showed the, the first uh, video we got out of Katrina of New Orleans, mm -hmm. and it was that helicopter going through, and you're just seeing devastation, and there's these people out there, and they're trying, and they just singling yes. up the thing, help, and then it came over that guy, and he's sitting in his backyard, he's got a fire going, he had a rendezvous set, and he's sitting there going, hey, 
He's cooking dinner. He's cooking dinner. He's got his set set up. He's pulling out of his freezer. He's cooking dinner. You need to know how to cook on a fire. Mm -hmm. If you are in the city, mm -hmm. hibachi grills are not that cheap, not exactly. that expensive. Yeah. And the Chi the Japanese have been cooking on hibachis for 500 years. Mm -hmm. You can cook on it for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they don't take up any space at all. Mm -hmm. I would go with a hibachi because it's the the bowl is cast iron. Mm -hmm. You don't have it's not cheap. Mm -hmm. uh, stamped metal, mm -hmm. and you know the by, grill comes off the top, and yeah. you can actually build a fire with wood in it. Yes, it ain't got to be charcoal so you get uh, coals going. Then you can put the grill back on it. If you live in a wood-deprived area, mm -hmm. you know, buy you four or five bags of charcoal, mm -hmm. put them in the closet, and forget about them. Mm -hmm. Right next to the hibachi mm -hmm. until you need it. Mm -hmm. Camp stove stuff like that, all of it's got sure. uses and. The thing about it is, is you need to have a go bag. You need to have some supplies in your vehicle in case you get stranded or whatever. Not going into the big, deep prepper hole and stuff like that. But it just no. makes common sense to have that. And it needs to, at everybody's house, you need at least a week's worth of fresh food. Mm -hmm. You need at least four weeks worth of frozen food. And at least... That's assuming the electricity stays. Uh, but again, what's going to happen when the power goes out? We're going to leave the freezer shut because I'm going to eat my canned stuff, my stuff I've already got. It's fresh. So that when I have to open that up, I'm going to start cooking for me and all my friends. Yeah. A good thing to have would be some sort of a generator. Yeah. Buy you more time. Yeah. Just, it doesn't have to be anything big or elaborate. Mm -hmm. Something that, uh, well, now you, you've been testing... A solar power generator yeah. for a while. And it works with a, a battery pack. Yeah. And it will run a refrigerator for several hours. And for my thoughts, down here in our hurricane front, mm -hmm. and you do like I do, whenever we're, a hurricane don't sneak up on you, no, you, you know it's coming. Yeah. So if they tell me that we're going to have a Category 3 or whatever coming in, the day before, at least, and where it's obvious it's coming here. Okay. I'm going to have two or three ice chests on the kitchen table. All your sandwich meat, all your condiments, all that stuff is going to be in that. The refrigerator is going to be packed, and then it's going to have jugs of cold water, preferably frozen jugs of water. Yeah, I was going to mention that. Put in there, and then I'm going to seal it up. When the power goes out, that's good for 48 hours without opening it. Mm -hmm. And everything I need should be in these coolers. Yeah, everything you're going to need up front should be in the coolers. And you mentioned the jugs of ice. Mm -hmm. When you finish with that gallon, that plastic gallon jug of milk, clean it out, put water clean in it. Clean it out, put water in it, drop it in your deep freezer. Exactly. Let it freeze. Because by doing that, you can pull it out, put it in your, in your cooler, mm -hmm. and you're good for 24, 36 hours. But you have cold water to drink when you're in the done. meantime. Yeah. Whenever that thing finally melts, as you still it, got drinkable water. As it melts, you've got drinkable water. And that's the big advantage over getting cold packs is you can't eat or drink it when you get no. done with it. But and I can you, water. Yes. And you got you have to have at least a gallon of water a day mm -hmm. under normal circumstances. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine, what they they the suggestion I gave them, they got small kids. Yeah. And so I told them tell them to take the two liter soda bottle. Mm -hmm. Fill them three quarters of the way up with Kool-Aid, freeze it. That's the ice to put into their thing. When sure. it thaws out, you got Kool-Aid for the kids. Sure. Got a good suggestion. And that was a good way to rotate it because they put them into their um, ice chest. It keeps the ice chest cool. When it finally gives up the ghost, you got to extract another frozen one and put in there. You now got a two liter bottle of Kool-Aid to give the kids. Mm -hmm. So you're con they hate drinking water. We know that. And it's not a bad idea for you to put something like that. I've even froze sweet tea before mm -hmm. for a hurricane. Yeah, don't, when you do that, though, mm -hmm. remember, don't fill it up all the way. No, leave yourself a good gap at the ice, top. Ice is going to expand mm -hmm. as it freezes. Liquid is going to expand. Mm -hmm. And you need to have a good head space mm -hmm. for it to, to move up into or you're going to burst the bottom. Usually I, I give it about that much. Yeah. So about two-thirds the top. Usually you come up the sides of it and it starts the taper in to go to the cap. 
about where it makes the taper, that's where I stop. And that allows it to expand up in there. I never have to bust one. But you're going to throw that bottle away anyway. So if I take it and I put it with a liquid that I can freeze. How are you going to throw it away? Well, again, you know. <laughs> most people are going to throw it away anyway. Recycle. Clean, clean it, recycle it, <laughs> repurpose it. Put it back into the freezer or whatever. Now, as far as what we're talking about, if I took a two liter soda bottle and I cleaned it well, mm -hmm. and then I dried it well, mm -hmm. I could put rice into it. Oh, definitely. And that's yeah. gonna extend my shelf life mm -hmm. of that rice. Yeah. And But I ain't gotta worry about a bag, I ain't gonna get weevils in it. No, you can up also container. take a glass jar mm -hmm. and put it in the oven on low, mm -hmm. on, you know, and warm it up, need to warm it up somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 degrees. Mm -hmm. Take it out, put your rice in it, and seal it, mm -hmm. finger tight. And as the jar cools, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to form a vacuum, and it's going to vacuum seal it in the jar. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have a cannon to do that. That works. You just you know, you stick it in the oven, warm the jar up. Mm -hmm. If you can sterilize your lid, sterilize your lids. Mm -hmm. And then take the jar out, put the rice in, finger mm -hmm. tight the lid, and just let it sit there and cool. Mm -hmm. And you'll hear it go click mm -hmm. when, the, when, it, when it vacuum seals. And it's good. Rice is good indefinitely. Well, you know, pasta. The, the pastas and you them big pasta. number 10 cans of Idaho instant potatoes. Yeah. You can yes. leave it sealed up in the can or put it into a glass jar or put it into a soda bottle, like I said. Mm -hmm. the, the soda bottle advantage is the fact they stack well. Mm -hmm. They're easily portable, and it's something that's not going to break easy. The envelopes. You can get an envelope of potatoes now. Mm -hmm. If you take those and put them in like a Tupperware, Mm -hmm. Container, a plastic container, mm -hmm. something that you can burp, mm -hmm. it'll last forever. Yeah, keep the moisture, keep anything else away from it. And you. it's not it's not cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the whole thing of it. A lot of people get to looking at, they want to go and buy these, um, and I'm not trying to badmouth anybody, but you'll see a lot of these things where they talk about, here's your survival bucket of food. Mm -hmm. And you go to look at it, and it's macaroni and cheese, rice, instant potatoes, milk powder, yeah. and something else usually. There's oh. not they're not twenty dollars worth of food in that bucket. No. You know? uh -uh. <coughs> now I've got I've got several buckets of that stuff around. Mm -hmm. But it's not my primary. Mm -hmm. It's just to get me through. Mm -hmm. And that's just it. You need um, a, something quick and easy and yeah. like me and Bear were talking about, you can go to uh, <coughs> you can go to Walmart and in the soup section, you'll find these bags of, it's actually, it's called uh, like really good chili. And it's basically dehydrated chili, bean chili. All right, then you've also got four or five other kinds of soup. All you gotta do is add water. You know, look around for those add water meals, like add water and make cornbread. You just gotta fry it. Add water to make biscuits, add water to make pancakes. Those are something because you're going to be able to get water and refine water. So therefore, it's something I can convert into something else relatively easily. You mentioned cornbread. Mm -hmm. Cornmeal. Yes. Buy cornmeal. And then, there's for frying cornbread, there's three ingredients. There's the cornmeal, the water, and the pinch of salt. That's it. That's Which now Granny always threw a pinch of pepper in it and a pinch of sugar too. There you go. There you go. You'll develop your own. It, it's something to experiment with and find out how you like to do it. But what we grew up with and something you don't see today was Granny walked into the pantry and there was the, the flour, the salt, the baking soda, yeah. the soda, and that turned into everything from pancakes to cupcakes to bread. To, yes. It's how she assembled the same component. Bisquick is just pre-made up. But with Bisquick, go look at the Bisquick site and get their uh, recipe book. You'd be shocked how many things you can make with that, but just how you vary it just a little bit in recipes, where it becomes a bread, where it becomes a dessert, mm -hmm. where it becomes whatever. A gravy. Or a gravy. And you're just starting out with the same ingredient. Mm -hmm. So with this ingredient, I can make 200 different dishes. You can sum everything that we've set up into one question, mm -hmm. and you'll understand when I give you the question. Mm -hmm. When did Moses, when did Noah build the ark? 
when it's when, before, when, before it started raining. Before it started raining. Yeah. Noah built the ark before it started raining. Yep. Okay, we see the signs. Mm -hmm. We see the the availability of some products becoming mm -hmm. less and less and less. Mm -hmm. Build your art. Start building now. Start building now before the rain sets in. Mm -hmm. um, I brought these books uh, just as learning aids, Rip. reference aids. I can't remember where I found this twisty tie. I think some guy with a hat on the <laughs> internet. Yeah. But the Petersons, Roger Torrey Peterson mm -hmm. was a noted uh, botanist mm -hmm. and when we were kids. Mm -hmm. This is Peterson's Guide to Edible Plants. Mm -hmm. This is Peterson's Guide to Medicinal Plants. Mm -hmm. And it's everything from essentially the Rocky Mountains to the Atlantic Ocean. Mm -hmm and from the Arctic Circle to the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. They are priceless information. When you couldn't get anything else and there is no internet, yeah. that's the thing, we rely so much on internet, we think we'll go look it up, but if suddenly all the power went click and there ain't no internet? Yeah, all you need is one rogue nation popping a nuclear device in the atmosphere, Yeah. and boom, it's it's 1887. Yeah, and if you don't have a book to go look it up, or you don't have the skill or knowledge ahead of time, yeah, you're not going to get it. I highly recommend this. Durable trades. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you can go through this book, and it tells you trades that are uh, meltdown proof. Mm -hmm. And I was looking through here, and. You know, I've highlighted the ones that I know how to do. Mm -hmm. The one, the ones that I know how to do are in yellow, and I've got, I've got a good many of them, mm -hmm. and as you do too. Yeah. And I put the ones in orange that I want to learn. Mm -hmm. Before it starts raining. Yeah, because you build need, your database. You need a marketable skill. I tell yeah. a lot of people come up and they've asked me, you know, what would I? Yes, it's important to learn to do woodcraft, bushcraft. I, I fully support that, but I have encouraged people, they've said, uh, what skill should I learn? And I tell them, go look online right now and learn how to turn PVC into bows. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, I don't, they said, look, if the world goes bad, how many empty buildings are going to have PVC pipe in it? And with just a fire and an oven mitt or a rag, you can make a functioning bow mm -hmm. in 20 minutes. I saw a video four days ago and doing exactly that. Make you a boat. You will have a skill where you can make something to trade to somebody mm -hmm. else. So if I have a skill to provide for myself, but I also need a marketable skill of something that I can make quickly and easily enough that I can trade to you for what you got. I mean, that's, yeah, that's it, durable trade. Something that's universal that we're gonna keep needing no matter what. I mean, that's just the way to go. If you already have a marketable skill, mm -hmm. if you are a nurse, mm -hmm. you have a marketable skill. To it within a reason. When you look at a doctor today, he's so computer reliant. Exactly. A pharmacist is actually more valuable because he knows what all the medicines do. And he, to a limited degree, he can prescribe. Exactly. So a pharmacist would know, as long as we're talking about pre-made up stuff, mm -hmm. a herbalist knows how to make something equivalent in nature. And which is part of that, coming back to you. Now, one of the things I want to point out is um, years ago I was reading a thing. It was some archaeologists who were looking at these villages over in the UK and in Europe. Mm -hmm. And they, they thought it was a religious thing because it didn't make sense to them. And what it was is these villages would often have right in the middle of them a clump of woods mm -hmm. that they would come in and this was not tilled, it was not whatever, this was just woods, and they thought they worshipped nature or whatever. Well then in the late 90s they got somebody like me looking at it and decided to look at what plants. It's a pharmacy. It's a, every plant in there was a wild edible, a wild medicinal. They had transplanted wild plants into this area. Now if you went up there and looked at it right now, you think it's just an overgrown patch of woods. 
But to them, that was food, that was medicine. That, that's the reason it was in the middle of the group. Mm -hmm. It didn't require cultivation. It grows wild. But they had went and gathered wood sorrel and brought it here. They had planted walnut trees, transplanted them. They had whatever and put in this two acres all the medicinal and wild growing plants they needed to survive. Your average oak tree, mm -hmm. depending upon the species, will produce thousands of acorns. Mm -hmm. And have you have you ever personally made acorn bread? I have made acorn flour and acorn bread before. It's delicious. It's wonderful. It's just labor intensive. It, it is. It is. And sometimes it's as stiff as this tabletop. Mm -hmm. But it's nutritious. And it don't go bad fast. And you, it's free. Go out here and pick it up. Mm -hmm. My kids and I, we used to live up in New Falls. Mm -hmm. When I worked up there, about 80 miles north northeast of us, we had a, a post oak tree in the yard. Mm -hmm. And we went out one day just on a wild hair. Mm -hmm. It was a Saturday, I think. Mm -hmm. And we gathered up probably 10 pounds of acorns. Mm -hmm. And we took them, we picked out the ones that weren't any mm -hmm. good, and took the ones that were and broke the kernel out mm -hmm. and washed them. Mm -hmm. there's, there's tannin in, in post oak. It's also called blackjack oak, but there's a lot of tannin in mm -hmm. that. It makes it very bitter. Yes, and you have to cook it, you have to boil it. Um, species like white oaks mm -hmm. don't have so much, they've got a bigger acorn probably the size of the end of my thumb mm -hmm. but it's a sweeter acorn mm -hmm. less refining got to be done to less refining got to be done but you take it you cook it you let it dry you pound it up mm -hmm. you can use it straight or mm -hmm. you can mix it with some flour and cut it mm -hmm. um, it's, it tastes a lot like whole wheat bread mm -hmm. It's good to eat. <clears throat> I've gathered up the acorns, done the, the thing of hulling them. Actually, I roasted mine a little bit first, then I hulled them. So you made coffee with them. Yeah. And then I uh, soaked them in running water for a week. I didn't boil them. And then after that, I let them dry. Then I pounded them and turned them into flour. And mm -hmm. we made hoe cakes out of them. Mm -hmm. And they were good. Like I said, it tastes like whole wheat. Mm -hmm. You can see why people ate this for thousands of years. It's just labor intensive is all. One thing that Blackie and I want to stress is you don't have to panic. No. You have you, options. You, there, right now you have options. And, you know, listen to the suggestions we're making. You don't have, you know, do what, do you. I mm -hmm. love to say do you. Well, do you. Mm -hmm. Check out other channels on, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. There are some very good resources out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you can't have too much education, mm -mm. whether you're learning it in sitting in the school paying for it, or you're learning it out here, mm -hmm. watching somebody actually do it. Mm -hmm. Either way, get out and learn it. Well, guys, we're going to, I think that's probably a long enough video by now. <laughs> Bear, thank you very much for having me talk with me. Glad to. And guys, we'll be doing more pretty soon, so just hang in there. Till next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day.